Well, good morning. It's uh, Sunday, 12th July 2020, and uh, I'm just going to welcome you as a few guys join us live. Uh, nice to see you there, Tanya and uh, Gabriella and uh, Jan and Arasi. Oh man, we miss all of you guys so much. It's like um, this is a second week of lockdown we're entering and uh, people are supposed to stay home as much as possible and coronavirus is getting a bit crazy in Antananarivo and uh, yeah it's, our hearts are still full of joy and peace uh, we're praying earnestly for our city at this time but uh, we're also very much uh, thankful for God's goodness and grateful for the friends and, and family that we're still in touch with and grateful that we can spend some time with you this morning uh, sharing the Word of God. I'm excited about what I'm going to preach this morning. It's a very simple message. And uh, I wanted to say also to Tutsu for giving us that worship time. Thank you. Well done. Uh, enjoy your song choice. It flows into what I'm going to share about this morning. And uh, yeah, we really appreciate the church and everything that everyone's been doing to uh, keep serving our community and keep encouraging one another at this time. So God is good. He's on his throne. Let's take some time to hear something from his word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day that you have made. As uh, Ina would say, it's a day of blessing. It's a day of grace. And we want to praise you, God, that you're on your throne today. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your goodness. And thank you for your word, which feeds us and strengthens us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're doing a series on the doctrine of man, and uh, this is now part 11. I managed to do a long series for a change, and uh, this is actually a, a third subpart dealing with um, what flows out of a good theology of place. And I've been speaking about how we are blessed to be a blessing, and uh, last week I felt like I hadn't been practical enough. I think I aim often at talking about the deep truths of God's Word because I know it's the deep truths, the foundational ideas that change us for the long term. I'm not a guy who's into six easy steps or a way to solve a problem in a hurry. I believe God sows deeply into our hearts and minds and transforms us progressively with His truth. And uh, yet today I felt I want to encourage us in a practical way as well. And so this message really is going to be an encouragement. And at the end of this message, I'm going to make a kind of a call and a call to action to say you guys should uh, try to put something into practice out of what I share this morning. Uh, the title of my message is a kind of love in action, be a blessing. And uh, I'm wanting to start with this phrase, we are in the world, but not of it. I mentioned it already. It's a phrase developed from John chapter 17, verse 14 to 15. And Jesus was speaking of his disciples and saying that uh, they are in the world and God's not going to take them out of the world. Uh, he doesn't want us to be removed from the world, but he doesn't want us either to live the way the world lives. So we're in the world, but not of it. And in the last few weeks, I've spent a fair amount of time talking about our place being with God in covenant relationship with him and not uh, being kind of tied to this world as if this is our only home. But our true home is in a new heaven and a new earth. And then I started to speak about the life a Christian lives now. In a, it's a new life. Uh, we are led by the Spirit of God and we are given an empowering grace. Grace isn't something which is passive. It's an active working power of God to achieve the things God wants you to achieve in your life. And because of Jesus, we have access to this grace. That God gives it to us freely because when he looks at us, he sees the righteousness of Jesus credited to us. That's the wonderful thing of the gospel, that we've received righteousness from, from God. And because of Jesus' life and death, we actually in right relationship with God. And so we have an expectation of empowering grace. This new life then is not a life of passivity. We're not just passively waiting for heaven. When we say our place is in heaven, it doesn't mean that we don't want to be on earth. It's actually a time now to demonstrate the culture of the kingdom of God and to proclaim the good news to others. So the Christian life should demonstrate this grace of God that we've received and speak to others, making an invitation to them to enter into the same life that we're enjoying, this life of right relationship with God. 
So far from waiting for a future life, we live the new life now in this world, yet not for this world, but for the glory of God. And today we're going to examine how this life is lived, how our new culture is lived out as a blessing to people around us. And we begin with a well-known passage in Jeremiah 29. I think everyone who's been a Christian for a while knows Jeremiah 29 verse 11. It says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. I think a verse like that is encouraging at a time like this pandemic, where we have to recognize God's plans towards us are still good. But I want to go beyond just that uh, bumper sticker fridge magnet verse. Uh, so many of us use it superficially and we, we say, yes, God has plans for us. But we also need to look at the context of that verse. We have to consider that um, God actually has plans and, uh, and these plans that Jeremiah was speaking to Israel are actually relevant to us today. Um, you see, Jeremiah was encouraging Israel that even though they were going into exile, even though they were about to be taken captive as a people, they were going to come under oppression from the Babylonians. They were going to be carried away from their place and they were going to be uh, held in captivity. We feel like that right now with this coronavirus. And uh, in some senses, I think a Christian would feel like that in this world because sin has exiled us from perfect fellowship with God. And we, in this life, know all its imperfections and our sinful natures and we're longing for the day when the weight of sin is actually removed. And, and that's what happens when we die. Our, our fleshly carnal bodies die and the sin nature with them and only in the resurrection life that we look forward to after this life will be, we be fully freed from the weight of sin and the, and, the, and, the, and the temptation and the pressure we live under in this world. And so we look forward to that day and we live now as a people who are actually in exile because we know this world is not our home. And so when God spoke to his people through Jeremiah to tell them that he had good plans for them, it's in spite of the fact that they're going into exile, it's in the very context of going into exile, God says, I've got things for you to do. There are things of great value that you need to do in your time of exile. In this world, God has great plans for us. And you can look at Ephesians 2 verse 10 that says God's actually prepared good works for us to do in this world, in this life. And so a key to understanding all of this is actually in the verses that lead up to verse 11. If we look at Jeremiah 29 verse 11 on its own, we don't get enough of the story. In verse 4 to 7, we read this. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. So those are the verses before verse 11. In verse 4 to 7, God says some very, very helpful things to his people for their time in exile. And I believe these things are very helpful to us as we live in this world where we know we are aliens and strangers here, where we know that our true home lies ahead of us with Jesus in the new heaven and the new earth. See, understanding God's instructions to his people through Jeremiah would actually help us to avoid the escapist half gospel where we get told, just try and find God's blessing for yourself. And you know it is the prosperity gospel, which is all about health, wealth and happiness. And makes a Christian live a life where everything about God is for them. It's personalized, it's internalized, it's directed inwards. The prosperity gospel is a false gospel because it's a half gospel. God does want to bless his people. But the way the prosperity gospel distorts it is, it says all this blessing is for you personally to, to name and claim and appropriate in your life. It's a lie. God said to Abraham, I will bless you, but you will be a blessing. And so when we look at 
These instructions that Jeremiah gave from God to his people, he said, build, prosper the city you're in, have families, have houses, live life on earth for the good of those around you. And so while in exile, we build, we plant, we produce, we procreate, we increase, we don't decrease, and we seek the prosperity of the city of our exile. We pray for it. If it prospers, you too will prosper. So what God's actually calling his people to do is to invest into this world, invest into the lives around you, invest away from yourself so that you become a blessing for the others that God has given you. It's interesting when I look at the life of Abraham. Abraham is this kind of prototype Christian. He, he is the guy that God called into a covenant of faith. And while Abraham was in covenant with God and he left his home, he left his place and he went on this pilgrimage with God looking for this heavenly city, he also became wealthy and powerful in this world. He was able to do Lot good when Lot was taken captive. Abraham went and with armies rescued Lot. Abraham became a patriarch. He proved his faith and righteousness was credited to him. So when I look at Abraham, he was no passive man. He wasn't a weak man. His pilgrimage didn't make him a spiritual weirdo. His pilgrimage didn't make him some kind of a, a unrooted, ineffective, no impact guy who just drifts from place to place. No, his pilgrimage with God made him powerful for God. He, he walked as a, as a man who was following God, a pioneer, a businessman, a warrior, and through his obedience, he became the father of our faith. My point is this. If you're a Christian, you are not here to mark time on earth waiting for Jesus to come back and fetch you. We're not called to a dull existence of chasing one more paycheck or waiting for one more month in so we can have pizza. We're actually here to build something, to obtain blessing, to be fruitful and to bring blessing. I read Psalm 1. I'm just going to highlight verse 3, but this is the man who is blessed. It says he is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. When I look at the image put forward in, in Psalm 1 verse 3 of us being trees planted by streams of water, I think of what that tree is doing. It's growing, it's steady, it's dependable, it's providing shade, it's providing fruit. We should expect our lives to be like a tree planted by streams of water. That's not an unreasonable expectation for a believer. To say, I want to be stable, I want to be fruitful, I want to be enduring, and I want to be prospering. Because a tree is a blessing. It brings shade, it brings shelter, it brings food. And a tree needs water. And I'll tell you today where that comes for you. It's not just the sermon on a Sunday. It's Jesus who is the ever-flowing source of life in us. Jesus is a never-ending supply of everything we need within us. He is a stream that will never run dry. And so when I look at a Christian life, I think we are called to, to establish something, to build something so that we prosper, so that we can share that with others. In what ways can we bring blessing? How, how does this dynamic operate in a believer's life? Well, I think it begins in our hearts where we say, I want to set my life apart for God. Every part of our lives should be devoted to God. We identify ourselves with Christ. We say, I am crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live, but Christ now lives in me. And this life I live, I'm going to live by faith. So that's my whole life devoted to God. We should, shouldn't live with a, a sacred secular schism, some kind of a division in our minds where Sunday alone is a day of worship. Rather, a believer views every part of his life as given for the glory of God. So when you work, you work for the glory of God. When you rest, you rest for the glory of God. When you play, you enjoy playing for the glory of God. And I don't mean playing a musical instrument. I mean recreational time is holy time. It's glorious. Enjoy the fruit God gives you. Enjoy the things he's given you. 
build into your family. Take time to establish something for his glory, whether it requires resting, working hard or recreational time. It's all for the glory of God. Your Monday is for the glory of God. Your Tuesday is for the glory of God. This week that lies ahead of us, the whole of it is for the glory of God. Your body is for the glory of God. All of it for the glory of God. You see, we're called to the very extraordinary business of ordinary life. Some wise men once taught me, we live lives that are supernaturally natural and naturally supernatural. In other words, we know that we are spiritual beings in a physical body, in a relationship with an invisible, eternal, almighty God. And what supernatural becomes part of our natural life and our natural life is part of a supernatural life. God's not looking for people who are just every word is a prophecy. Everything is some kind of a bumper sticker message. He's looking for normal people, not spiritual weirdos. He wants ordinary people empowered by his grace to live their ordinary life well. And that would be extraordinary. That would be amazing. If you could live ordinary life well, you would be living an extraordinary life. And so how do we live ordinary life well? How do we as regular folk with families or single folk, students, scholars, business people, how do we live ordinary life well? Well, here are a number of encouragements. I could have found you a scripture for each one. I didn't. You can go look for a verse if you need a verse. But these are simple truths that will help you to understand how to be a blessing. Use your talents, firstly. Use the gifts God's given you. If you have a brain, learn. If you have a skill, develop it. If you have something that's, that you've invested in, you will make more of it. It will become a stronger gifting in your life and then you can share it with others. I've seen people who can play musical instruments, young people in TCC, serving our church with worship, using their phone to record it and sending it to us, and it lifts our spirits. They're doing things I could never do with the gifts God's given them. They've invested in those gifts, and then they've shared those gifts. So that's my first encouragement to you. What is it that you can do? What is it that God's put in your hand? Invest in it, develop it, share it with others. That's how we become a blessing. If you're a business-minded person or the head of a household, maybe you're just a father or a, a single mother and you're leading your household, aim at becoming financially stable. It's not immoral to want to be financially stable. It's not greedy to say, I want to earn money if I'm in business. Are you in business? If you're a businessman, aim to make a profit through honest work. And I always want to say, Aim to be rich. If you're in business, you should try to be the best you can and you should try to get exceedingly wealthy. You should try to make a huge profit. You see, if your heart is in the right place, God will use that to bless others. Don't be ashamed to succeed. And if you're a successful businessman and you're wealthy, you can be a radical believer without having to show off your wealth. It's all about what's going on in your heart. You see, I've met businessmen who were hugely instrumental in all the work that we as a family do in Madagascar. There's a guy in South Africa who sowed thousands, tens of thousands of dollars into missions. I'm not going to name him. He doesn't want to be named. He hasn't set foot in Madagascar. And yet by his investment into our lives, he's actually brought many feet into the nations. His feet have never set foot in Madagascar. But his finances have sent many feet into Madagascar. That's what business people can do. They can also demonstrate ethics into a world that's devoid of integrity. They can say no to a bribe. They can take no part in corruption. They can stand by the mercy of God. They can pay honest wages. They can employ many people. A successful business can be a huge blessing to many people. And people who are financially strong can enable kingdom vision and bless many in their lifetime. We must not fall for the modern fashion of resenting the rich. I say that clearly because in the, the Western thinking at the moment, if you read Facebook comments, it's almost like rich is evil. Rich is not necessarily evil. 
Greed is evil, but rich can be an immense blessing. And we want rich people who are generous people to advance the kingdom. If God's called you into business, do business well. Become wealthy. Have faith that God will prosper you. Another context where people sometimes feel they shouldn't invest is their own domestic context. They think, God's called me to work, but what about my family? I, I can't take time out for them. I'm too busy. No, no, you can take time out for your family. You can go on holiday with your family. Healthy marriages make stable homes which can act as an oasis in a community. And this isn't just for married couples. Actually, if you are a single person, you can build your life in such a way that your domestic environment becomes a place where other people can find refreshment. You can have a neat home where you welcome guests and you serve them food. You don't have to be married or even a family to do this. You have to have vision that I want to make my domestic context an oasis of blessing for others. So that means I'm going to rent a place that I can invite someone in for a cup of coffee and I can serve them a meal and they will be blessed. And I'm going to ask God for peace in my home, whether I am married or whether I have a failed marriage, whether I have a healthy family or whether I'm a single parent. I'm going to build an environment of blessing around me by faith so that other people can take shelter there. Hospitality can be a huge blessing. So invest in your domestic context. I don't mind if that means you have to take time off to be with your family. I don't mind how you work that out. I'm not going to tell you how to work it out. I'm just creating this picture for you that where you live should be a place of safety, a place of refuge, a place of shelter, a place of peace, a place of blessing for others. What about children? If you have them, raise godly children. In recent times, individualistic societies have started to have smaller and smaller families. We look at the West, some nations are actually shrinking. They look at children not as a reward, but as a burden. They look at the cost more than the potential return on investment. They think of the inconvenience more than the honor. Now I want to tell you something about children. They're hard work. They'll practically kill you as a parent with the burden you have to carry. Yes, those things are true. But we should realize that it is through children that blessing can be multiplied to future generations. Through children, blessing can be multiplied to future generations. Children are a blessing and they become the blessing to the next generation. So never fail to value the investment you can make as a parent. Parenting is a privilege, not a nuisance. It is perhaps the greatest legacy you could ever leave in this world. And even single people can recognize the, the importance of what God's doing into the next generation and invest into children's lives so that they can become a blessing in the next generation. So view children as an inheritance. View them as a, a generational blessing that will be multiplied, even if they're not your children, even if you don't have children. Children are not a nuisance. Children are a legacy for the future. It's a way the next generation will be blessed. Another thing you can do is, is serve others. I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 20, because Jesus here is our role model. In Matthew 20, 25, Jesus calls his disciples together and says, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's Jesus, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the glorious maker of the universe, who humbled himself and came and lived to serve others. And if you want to understand kingdom culture, your life is a blessing for others means your life is not exalted over them. We don't seek fame. We don't seek status. We don't seek honor. We seek to lay our lives down for the sake of our spouse, for the sake of our family, for the sake of our employees, for the sake of our students, for the sake of the people around us, we serve. Jesus came to serve. Another point, be generous. 
Well, here I've got a story for you. When we first came to Madagascar, we started to look at the society around us and think about how we would live out our lives here. And we want to be a blessing to the people around us. Yes, we're that to a measure. I don't think we are all particularly generous, but in any case, it's not about us. The story was just how we watched uh, people who had been in the mission field for years, getting ready to leave, going back or being redeployed somewhere else, and they would have a sell-off of all their stuff. And there were some missionaries who would mark their goods as if they were brand new, and they would try to raise as much money as they could so that they could take this money out of the country and set themselves up comfortably in a new location. And that disturbed us. It's sad to see people positioned to be generous, but acting very much out of self-preservation. And it bothered me. And, uh, and I thought about it deeply and I thought, you know, when, when it comes time to leave Madagascar, which probably for me means going to heaven to be with Jesus because I think I'll live out my days here. But if I ever had to, I want to bless before and as I leave. I don't want to try and gather everything for myself. And so I think these days I've recognized that that bad example of selling for a profit and uh, trying to gather everything for yourself and your own prosperity is more the exception than the rule within our community. So I'm not going to leave you with the bad example of no generosity. But here's a good example. There's another missionary couple who lives nearby us. And sometimes they just bring us some fruit. Sometimes they just bring us some few groceries that they don't need or some spices. Occasionally there's a, just a cake that gets given as a gift. There are other gifts, other expressions of generosity. They have shown generosity to us, to my family, for no reason. They're just a blessing. And I would say this, when I grow up, I want to be like them. When I grow up, I want to find ways to bless my neighbor. When, when, when I can, I want to think of how can I do good just as an act of kindness to someone else. So that's the small scale reality. Every one of us can be a blessing just by sharing something with a neighbor. Not one of us is too impoverished to, to do that. But then I want to say, lastly, if you want to be a blessing, be radical in how you live. The, the guys like Zacchaeus, who came to Jesus and recognized the fault of his ways, turned their lives around. Zacchaeus gave half of his wealth away to make right for what he'd done. When we look at the believers in Acts chapter 2, selling their possessions, sharing with one another, giving to the poor, we see a real and radical change has happened because Jesus has impacted someone. In Ephesians, Paul speaks about how the dividing wall between the Jew and the Greek, the Gentile and the Jew, it's been removed that God is making one new person out of these nations that hate each other. And I think of racism and I think of the issues of, of, of race that the world's grappling with. And I can see the gospel speaks and says radical change can happen in your life. You can be a radical blessing in that area when the gospel comes into your life. We see in history that even from our archaeology we can see that people so changed after the gospel came that there were wealthy people who, who, who allowed their poor servant to take up a place in their tomb. That's radical. Changing your burial customs because of the gospel, welcoming somebody who's not from your family to come and take a place in your tomb when you're rich and they're poor, that's what the gospel can do. It can utterly change the heart of a man. And so if you understand the gospel, you understand that you would find ways to be a blessing. It could be radical generosity. It could be dismantling racism. It could be attacking classism in your own life and offering your house, offering your, your, your tomb to somebody who comes from a different socioeconomic bracket. It's radical stuff. And so my, my final kind of encouragement is practically don't live a mediocre life. Live a radical life for the glory of God. There is nothing ordinary about the Christian life. It is a courageous, convicted, changed life. It's a life that's lived by faith, that's seen in our actions. 
Matthew 5 verse 16 says, In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. So we're not talking about some kind of a moralism. I'm concluding now, but we're not talking about some kind of a moralism. It's not good works that make you look better in God's eyes. It's not good works that you need to do in order to be saved. No, it's a gospel of grace that comes and empowers works of faith. Jesus doesn't come to make bad people better. He doesn't come to improve us. He comes to people who are spiritually dead and he makes them alive. It's a night to day, dark to light transformation. The new life is a radically new life. It's a, it's a new root with new fruit. We are new creatures with new natures. When we come to Christ and make our home with him, we seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. The outflow is blessing into this world. So I want to encourage you to trust God and let him put your faith to the test. Like he tested Abraham, God has planned to bless us and make us a blessing. So trust God with a bigger dream. Maybe there's a business goal or a relationship goal or some thing you have to dream. God would bless you in so that you could become a blessing to others. And then start with something practical. Start with something real. Right now in this coronavirus pandemic, we're reading reports in the news of how people around us in this city and in this nation have lost up to 60% of their income already through lost work opportunities. Taxi drivers who have nobody to drive around. Maybe you could just walk up to a taxi driver and give him the fare, even though he's not going to take you anywhere. Maybe you could go to someone who, who ordinarily doesn't uh, need much from you, like your domestic employee, and just pay them a, a double salary. Maybe you could find somebody uh, who's already meeting the needs of the community, like John and Kath, Henri Louise, Tanya. There are people around us in our church who are serving communities, and you could just go to them and say, how can I help become a bigger blessing? Where can I give an offering? How can I send money to somebody in need? Be a blessing. You don't need a massive light to come and shine from heaven to show you an opportunity. Bake a cake and take it to your neighbor, but be a blessing. This is the outworking of the new nature. This is the new community. This is the culture of the kingdom of God. Our lives are given for the sake of others. Let's pray. Father, stir our hearts today. We want to make a decision to be a blessing to others. Help us to have an ambition to build our lives that they would provide shelter refuge and strength and help to others no matter who we are lord god bless us so that we can bless others in jesus name amen god bless you i pray you have a wonderful week and reach out and chat to someone we're going to do our um, zoom call at 11 30 as usual uh, but uh, even if you don't join that get in touch with someone else and share some words of blessing have a great week